Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, I know we're going to have a few more folks probably will hear the dings of a few more joining us, and that's just wonderful. I'm glad um, to be able to welcome you to today's Knowledge Exchange event. Uh, I'm Sheila Schulein, and I am Elder Abuse Prevention Consultant for the North Region. And I'd um, like to make introduction and give a big thanks to our small but mighty planning committee. I'm not sure if um, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna make sure that you can actually see me. And perhaps my uh, planning committee members can do the same. I don't know if Adriana uh, Costa is with us. Ida, if you're with us, maybe let your face be known because I'd like to thank you. She's an assistant professor with the School of Nursing and adjunct professor with the Faculty of Health Sciences Research Associate at the Center for Education and Research on Aging and Health at Lakehead. Um, so she's been helping us pull this together as well as Catherine Phillips, who is also with Lakehead University's School of Nursing and is president of the Gerontological Nursing Association um, Ontario's Northwest chapter. So thank you both. It's certainly been a pleasure um, working with you to bring this opportunity together um, and, and share this learning. Uh, joining me also today uh, is my colleague, uh, Rayanne Rideout. She's Director of Partnerships and Outreach with Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. And she's going to be checking a chat and assisting me generally with tech support. So welcome to everyone, special welcome to those folks. And before we start our day, it's very important um, that we consider truth and reconciliation and deliver our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with our original peoples of this land, one that is based in honor and deep respect. Just a couple of um, housekeeping slides before we, we get going. Um, of course, we're asking attendees to keep themselves mute until we open up the question sessions, uh, just so that we can minimize the background noise. Uh, every attendee has, their ch has a choice to show their videos during, during a, the presentation and you know to maybe put, uh, put your uh, camera back on during question and answer. I'm gonna ask the presenters as they're presenting, of course, to, um, to have their cameras on. Uh, if you want to adjust your speaker image, drag the line between the image frame and the slides to the left, and you might want to do that just as you're getting started. Again, we have the chat box open. Um, Rand will probably be monitoring that for me. Post comments during the sessions there. You can, um, I, think we have, I think we have a question and answer box as well, or if not, um, you can type them into the chat box as well. We'll be discussing the questions together with the speakers after their presentations. So as those questions come up, please, please feel free to uh, type them in and we will go through the questions at the end of each presentation. As you know, um, the recording is going on now and we will have um, a recorded version of this session posted to our website uh, probably next week. So come and check for that. Uh, we are also going to ask you to participate in an evaluation at the end of today's session. There'll be a pop-up message and uh, we'll ask you to, to do some polling questions with us. Uh, we hope that the poll will work. If not, we will be sending you a link to a survey. We also want to acknowledge that we're very, very um, conscious and respect your privacy and confidentiality. And of course, there may be personal circumstances or burning questions that you'd like to answer some, ask some of the presenters that might disclose some of the personal information um, or that you just need more resources on. So if you would like to discuss specific circumstances, we're going to ask that you connect with me um, following this webinar or another person at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, one of, one of the um, consultants will gladly help you and keep, a, keep the conversation confidential. A little bit about us, who we are that are, that are uh, bringing you today. Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario, our mission, you can see it there. Uh, we envision Ontario where all seniors are free from abuse, have a strong voice, feel safe and respected. So achieving our mission really requires a, a raising of awareness, doing events somewhat like we're doing today, uh, delivering education and training. We work collaboratively, collaboratively with like-minded organizations 
and we really try to assist with service coordination and advocacy. We are, um, our, our role is really to enact the Ontario strategy to combat abuse, which um, is, some folks may not know that, I ask everyone just to mute their microphones if that's okay. Um, Ontario strategy to combat elder abuse. You may or may not know that exists, but it is a three pillar approach, three pillars of the strategy. First is public education and awareness. Uh, we have a province-wide multimedia public education campaign, really to generate more of an awareness about the issues of elder abuse and provide information on how to access supports and services. Uh, our role is also to provide training to frontline staff anyone really working with older adults who have an interest in training can access our training. Uh, we specialize it and we work with various sectors who work directly with seniors. We really, our goal there is to enhance their knowledge and skills and, and enable them to recognize and respond to elder abuse. Coordination of community services. Uh, we strengthen communities across the province through building partnerships, promoting information, Sharing, supporting, sharing and supporting their efforts to combat elder abuse. And in that way, we spend um, a portion of our, our time as consultants working with local networks. And I know that some of my local networks are represented here today. So thanks for joining us. I would now like to invite one of our project uh, leads, new to our, new to our agency, but very welcomed, is Barry Ann Wilson. She's going to make an, an exciting announcement for us. It's going to be in French for a change. And uh, here's the English translation. Barry Ann, if you wouldn't mind putting on your camera and unmute yourself, we'd love to hear the invitation you have to extend. Okay. So it's all good there, Sheila? Am I, am I on? You are on, I can hear oh. you. Okay. Hi everyone. So as Sheila said, I'm, I'm happy to be able to present this in French. What, I'm, what I'll be saying is, is up for you to read in English, if that's your preference. Bonjour tout le monde. La prévention de la maltraitance envers les aînés pour l'Ontario est très content de vous annoncer que le travail est débuté afin d'établir un réseau francophone pour la, pro la prévention de la mal maltraitance envers les aînés pour la province de l'Ontario. Le but de ce réseau francophone est de continuer l'accomplissement de la mission et du mandat de l'organisme, celle de créer un Ontario qui est libre d'abus envers les personnes âgées, ainsi que d'assurer que ces adultes venant de communautés francophones seront capables d'accéder le soutien et les services qu'ils ont besoin dans la langue de leur choix. On, on est à la recherche d'individus qui peuvent s'engager avec nous pour assurer que ce réseau francophone devienne une réalité. Si vous êtes intéressé et vous aimeriez en faire part, s'il vous plaît, laissez votre nom dans le chat box euh, durant cette session aujourd'hui et on pourra vous euh, contacter par après. La prévention de la maltraitance envers les aînés pour l'Ontario réalise que cette initiative est en retard et pour cette raison, nous faisons appel à tous nos partenaires dans nos communautés pour nous aider à accomplir cette tâche. Nous anticipons votre réponse favorable aujourd'hui ou le plus tôt possible afin de combler ce mandat. Merci tout le monde. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry Ann. And so we're very excited about this opportunity and we, um, we hope that uh, many of you will be interested in participating. So as you can see, we have a, a packed afternoon and I don't want to take any time away from our fabulous speakers. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Elaine Wersma. Elaine is an Associate Professor in the Department of Health Sciences at Lakehead University, the Associate Director of the Center for Education and Research on Aging at Lakehead University, and the co-editor of Dementia, the Journal of Social Research and Practice. Originally hailing from Southern Ontario, 
She has lived in Thunder Bay since 2004 and now considers this home. Elaine started working with older adults at the age of 19, and this has been a lifelong passion of hers, especially people living with dementia. Having spent many years working with older adults and practicing research, particularly individuals with dementia, Elaine's research aims to tell people's stories in ways that challenge stereotypes and misconceptions of older people, particularly people with dementia. Advocacy, inclusion, and rights from the fundamental values underlying her, work, underlying her work with people with dementia. Using participatory qualitative methods, methodologies, her research spans community and long-term care, exploring aging and dementia care, context of rural and Northern communities, and quality of life issues. And with that, Dr. Wersma, the screen is yours. I'll just stop sharing. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so let me just pull my, uh, my slides up here then. Um, and let me just move everyone off of here and get myself set up. Um, and you can see purple with some photos of the North. Great, fantastic. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for attending this afternoon, especially in the uh, deep depths of winter with the snow that we seem to be having all across Ontario, uh, especially here in the north. Um, but it is my pleasure to be here with you today. I do see some familiar names, but many, many um, unfamiliar names. And so it's really nice to connect uh, with people across the north. Um, I, uh, as, uh, as Sheila mentioned, I've been working with older adults for many, many years, um, a lifetime, I suppose. Um, and uh, the, the idea of, of human rights, of advocacy, of respect, of citizenship is what underlies my work. And so today I wanted to talk not from a, a legal sense or a policy uh, perspective, but I really wanted to talk about the, the values for all of us that underlie our community, um, our communities, our culture, um, and, and how we live those every day. Um, how communities, how can we, how we can create- I'm gonna, I'm gonna change direction a little bit um, and talk a little bit about how we, what we can do to, to prevent uh, abuse uh, in older adults in some circumstances. And I, I'm going to focus really on interfamily uh, issues in terms of, we you know that a lot of abuse in older adults unfortunately stems from within family or extended family. Um, but I was listening very carefully to what Elaine had to say. And so I'm going to sort of try to add some of those components in as well. Um, So what I'm going to talk about today is the whole idea is, is can we use mediation? Can we use a, an assisted negotiation to help resolve some of the, the crises, the stresses that are developing within families? And I'm going to talk about certain circumstances um, to sort of um, prevent the, the growing crises that can result in, in um, um, uh, bad outcomes. So what is mediation? So mediation, as I said earlier, is, a is assisted negotiation. So really you're involving a third party to help the family or, the, or the help the participants to address the conflict and to look at often the underlying issues and either to help the family or to help the, the participants to, to develop um, a way to resolve the conflict or uh, to figure out how they're going to work um, going forward, notwithstanding that conflict. So the agree to disagree sort of path, can we find out a way to coexist and, and uh, plan going forward? And so I'm gonna talk about a number of uh, um, situations where this may be. And the more I listened to, to um, Elaine, the more I wanted to add to my list. So I will sort of, uh, I might sort of poke things in as well. 
So intergenerational conflict, which previously was known as elder mediation in Ontario. So uh, I think it speaks for itself. It's, it's really dealing with uh, issues specific to the, the older population, but often that involves intergeneration. So the uh, older adult and their adult children. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I'm gonna to refer to as the gray divorce and remarriage. So what happens as there are added complications to older adults who divorce and who repartner, because so we'll address some of those issues. And of course, then there's the whole component of the state disputes, the state planning, and how that comes in. So I'm going to take a little bit of time um, to address those. Another area that I'm not going to talk about in specific, but which sort of made me think about it when I was listening to Elaine, is the whole idea about mediation between inner community or interagency. So I was listening to sort of having to fight the system, if you will, for um, the rights for services, the rights for treatment options. And I'll use um, Elaine's example with her dad. Um, and sometimes asking a mediator to come in helps to balance the power. It's not the individual versus the system, but perhaps with an assisted negotiation, the option of having someone that facilitates that conversation and makes it less over sort of the David and Goliath uh, challenge. So let's talk a little bit about intergenerational conflict. So I'm picking some examples out of the blue, but the list is endless, but these are sort of common areas where we've seen um, sort of an increased crisis blooming. We know that in Canada, the largest growing cohort is adult children moving back into homes with their parents, often bringing new partners with them. And so the parents who have finally become empty nesters find they no longer are, and they are now find themselves sharing their resources often uh, with their um, adult children who um, uh, are living in their same home. So this can result in conflict. When are they moving out? Uh, are they going to move out? Are they thinking they're just going to wait you out, so force you out of the home? Um, and of course, that almighty money thing that is often the stem of much conflict uh, in our community. So these are areas that we're seeing, um, again, areas where um, conflict is being created. And, and unfortunately, we're seeing things that end up involving police and and uh, um, uh, criminal charges when things don't go well. And unfortunately, we don't really have an infrastructure set in unless they sort of cross a, a clear criminal line around an assault charge. It's very difficult for you know, police to intervene. We've got people all living in a house. It's an inter-house conflict, um, you know, other than sort of suggesting someone leave for a cooling down period, there's very limited um, things that can be done. And again, this is where really a, there needs to be a conversation. What's going to happen that this situation is not um, indefinite? And again, it's complicated by the fact that the emotions are involved. And when you have emotions involved, then um, often um, people make excuses for each other as well. Another area within a family that we see some um, challenges is around long-term planning for an older adult. So we have a parent who has been living on their own and there's three children, two are living in Thunder Bay and one is living in Sudbury and that's where the parent is. So the parent, the, 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 the child living in Sudbury has by geographic considerations assumed or been required to assume the primary care of supporting their aging parent. And, and that might have started with helping them go to the grocery store or taking them to doctor's appointments. But as that parent ages, that responsibility becomes more and more. And so we get this conflict, this building in terms of between the, the, the spouses, or the, sorry, the, the siblings around sharing that responsibility and often siblings 
from afar are very good at giving instructions or critique, but not so good at coming and providing respite or um, um, money uh, to help in that. So we build this, this sort of um, ticking time bomb, if you will. And, and it, it's added complication when the power of attorney, um, there may be one for money, there may be one for- On the location of Dr. Minty, um, I was wondering if I get a sort of phone. Sorry, somebody's not muted, so I'm going to ask that you'd mute. Thank you. Um, so you can have these two of the siblings might have a power of attorney for health and another one for money, and those may be opposing interests. Uh, so again, you, this is this can be a stress. There can also be that need to have some help to to make some of those difficult decisions. Uh, for an older adult where maybe having them live on their own is no longer viable. What supports can, what planning can be done? Is there a plan that would allow in-home care? Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that most adults prefer not to consider going into long-term care, especially given the great reputation that they've all been getting lately. So it's um, how, how to help in the family to sort of make these difficult decisions. When we, whoops, sorry. When we talk about families that are separating, um, separation is always messy or can all often be messy, but there are many different, different uh, additional challenges when we have older adults. And, um, Older adults are often at that point or on uh, um, a fixed income. So separation adds an extra financial stress to that separation. Um, their retirement planning was all based, sorry, was all based on um, sort of the, the couple being intact. And so separating and the cost of separating is becomes a, a very difficult uh, challenge. Um, there are some legal issues and I'm just going to address one of them. And for example, um, when we retire, we can only designate one beneficiary and that beneficiary is the spouse with whom you resi reside on the date of retirement. So now, when you are separating after retirement, that designation cannot be changed. It's an irrevocable designation. So now your beneficiary is going to be your past spouse. It cannot be your current or future spouse. So there are legal challenges that they have to address that the population, younger population doesn't have to. And when we have long-term relationships and we have this older population, um, often we have established patterns within that relationship. So um, one of the spouses or over the other, or in, in many cases, mutually in different, different areas, each spouse has taken primary responsibility for certain aspects of, of the workings of that relationship. So one spouse may have been the housekeeper, the house, the caregiver within the relationship. Uh, one one might have been you know, the the one parent, the one the one adult that had a car that that drove, continued to drive, as an older adult, or that may have been in charge of the organization, paid the bills, and managed the housekeeping. There may have been a language of one parent or one spouse lived out, worked outside of the home and one didn't. So the spouse within the home never really integrated in, into the um, mainstream population in terms of speaking English. So once we have this separation, we may find that we have um, adults that are uncomfortable or unprepared, if you will, for living on their own. They don't uh, know how to manage a household. They don't know how to, to cook. Uh, they don't know, they don't have drive or they don't have access to a vehicle. They don't speak the language. So they're feeling they're particularly vulnerable. And I go back to um, 
Elaine's conversation that often the circumstances create the vulnerabilities and their vulnerabilities make people um, vulnerable, if you will, to, for abuse. So kind of that situation where this could happen. Um, and of course, as we get older, often we have um, underlying health challenges that become more prevalent. So again, spouses that could support each other within a relationship, not so functional uh, on their own. And not surprisingly, that also can put pressure on our adult children so that we have possible allocation of responsibility to them for uh, a parent's care. So um, the adult children often become far more invested in mom and dad's separation. There's concerns about money, the cost to the future estate, their hereditary interests, um, inheritance in interests. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and we could see them taking positioning and taking sides in the parental separation. Often if there's a, a new partner has emerged um, and so adult children get involved and it creates this, this crisis within that family. So the other side of separation is also often this thing called remarriage and repartnering. And, and again, I'm going to revert back to Elaine's uh, comments because she talked a little bit about this vulnerability thing and the right to grow and make your own decisions and risk taking. So here's that um, opposing interest thing going on. So we have we have this interesting legal uh, inconsistency in Canada. We are required to be mentally competent to enter into a legal separation um, to, to create a separation agreement to get divorced. But interestingly, there is no equivalent of that requirement to get married. Anybody can get married just regardless of their mental capacity. And so that sort of sets up this vulnerable sector again. So let's just take an example. Um, your widowed father, who has been uh, widowed for five years, he's 75 years old. He was recently diagnosed with dementia, uh, but he's early, early onset at this point. Um, he, your mom's uh, will left everything to him, as do most uh, spousal wills in this country. You leave everything to your spouse, and then if the spouse dies then to the children is sort of the common travel of inheritance, recognizing that obligations by parents to leave money or leave our estates to our adult children is not existent. Um, we are obligated to, to make sure our minor children are taken care of, but it's perfectly within our rights to um, leave our entire estates to the SPCA if that's what we choose to do. Um, tradition is a little different. I think most children expect to inherit from their parents. So just to put that context. So your, your dad has shows up at your door and says, uh, I've decided to get remarried. I met this woman online three weeks ago and we're off to Vegas, we're getting married. And oh, by the way, she's 35 and has two young children. So as an adult child, how do you respond to this? You have all sorts of concerns. Is your dad competent to make this decision? There's no question he's very happy right now. He's got you know some young gal who's making him feel pretty great about himself. Um, so as a adult children, you're thinking, well, okay, you've got a possible caregiver here to look after dad, this is great, he's, she's, he's going to be well taken care of. But then you might have all these concerns that she's just going after him for his money. And all of your mother's heirlooms that have been left in care, if, if you will, to your dad are at risk of being siphoned off into her children because presumably 
she will, he will predecease her. So then will she not end up with the estate uh, and all of your interest in what you thought you were going to get, you know, your great grandmother's sterling silver set may end up in someone's hands that have no interest at all. And of course, then there's the concern that your dad's being taken advantage of. But isn't this about risk taking? That risk taking doesn't he have the right to grow and to make his own decisions and to take his risks? But then there's the matter of his recent diagnosis. So you can see that this can create all sorts of challenges within a family um, and, and complications that we don't see in, in sort of um, um, sort of a younger uh, remarriage situation. So when we talk about those oops, inheritance situations, um, as soon as, as this woman, uh, going back to my example, moves into your dad's house, that becomes their matrimonial home if they're getting married. She's automatically entitled to 50% then interest, even in, even in the absence of something else. And yet that was, you know, your house you grew up in, you had an ownership to it. In your planning, you figured you were going to get your share of that house. You weren't getting one, your share, perhaps, of 50% of it. Of course, your dad could now, in fact, leave everything to his, you know, new spouse in his will, which he may have influence around, um, you know, redrafting. Um, if again you have concerns about the, this person. So certainly again, the legislation leaves this vulnerability to our older adults in terms of sort of making them vulnerable um, to um, scheming, uh, strategic remarrying from some, some people. Um, and yet we don't want to say they can't remarry and have a chance at happiness. So it does create all sorts of uh, interesting um, um, challenges. So in, in connection to all this, let's talk about some of those estate issues. So when we talk about estate issues, you know, often we'll have, um, you know, planning. So, um, we might have one child named, named as a, the health PO and one named as, a, as the money PO. And of course, those often have opposing interests. Um, some parents get even get more exciting and they'll leave multiple POAs to each category. So we have these you know, warring POAs, if you will, having difficulty making any decisions. Um, an area that I've done a lot of work in is the decisions made to sell the family home. Um, you know, a widowed parent perhaps is saying, I can't manage it. Um, that widowed parent may or may not have, um, you know, be at a place of good health. They've decided that they no longer can care for this home. They want to downsize it. Um, they're going into some kind of assisted housing or supported housing or at least a smaller housing. And so the children now are sort of expected to step up and assist the parent in the selling and the distribution of the chattels, the stuff in the home. And you get all these sort of conflicts going around distribution of work. And again, because perhaps by geographic location, some siblings are less hands-on because of distance. There's all these issues around missing or loaned items. Whatever happened to grandma's pearls, they're no longer in the jewelry box. Did somebody take them? Nobody took them. And it creates all these crises uh, within, the, um, um, within the, the, the sibling group. Um, and then my favorite is the you know, provisions where um, a parent leaves their estate to be equally divided between my five children without sort of any further direction. And we end up with sort of, again, these five children unable to sort of resolve these differences. Not so much a issue of um, older adult use, but certainly um, 
without sort of planning at the earlier stages can result in something after the fact that can be challenging. So let's talk a little bit more about mediation. It's certainly not always appropriate and it's important to understand that mediators will always do a screening before mediation starts to ensure that mediation is appropriate. Um, and most mediators are available to consult on possible referrals. So even when it's just in the planning stage, um, and mediation can be customized to address some concerns. So sometimes we'll do mediation by shuttle. So there's actually no direct contact between the parties. Um, I used to say I shuttled from room to room. Now it's more a shuttle between those Zoom meeting rooms um, in our new reality of where we are these days. Um, but I have to say, um, it's important to note that mediation is an unregulated profession. So it is a buyer beware. In the North, it is still in its infancies. Um, we've been working hard to develop mediators. We've got family mediators, we've got child protection mediators in some regions. And I mean, I can sort of assure you that uh, if there's a demand, um, there are mediators that will do the further training to become elder mediators. In the short term, again, with the wonder of Zoom, um, there are elder mediators in Southern Ontario um, and, um, you know, but my commitment has always been, we're going to build capacity within the North. Um, and so that would be sort of my commitment. Um, it's important to know that the OAFM, uh, Ontario Association for Family Mediation, maintains a roster or they credit and maintain a roster of accredited mediators, both in uh, family mediators, child protection mediators, and elder mediator, mediators. And so that's an ACEM um, designation. I haven't heard that that designation name is changing, notwithstanding that the language has changed to intergenerational mediation. And you can see why. A lot of the mediation around working with the older population is often uh, intergenerational. It's really about conflict uh, within the family or uh, it may be around older adult issues, but it's often out within the family, um, whatever the family looks like um, component. So a little bit about who we are, Mediation North. Uh, we are the court connected mediation service for all the courts in Northern Ontario. So we go as south as Perry Sound and we provide services um, remotely to flying communities, but we're based locally in all the courts from Kenora to Timmins um, and, and down as far as Perry Sound, um, both in the North and the Northwest. Um, and we can, under that contract, and, and I'll talk about funding in a minute, we can assist with the gray divorce issues. So uh, older couples that are separating, um, certainly we can assist uh, uh, with those issues and that would be subsidized by the ministry and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and a number of our mediators on our team are also qualified as intergeneration mediators. So um, because I also run a team in the South, um, you know, those intergeneration mediators in the South can help in terms of supporting um, those services uh, in the North until we get North-based mediators in place across the, play across the community. And um, our mediations are mostly being done via Zoom. And I'd like to say that we'll see a hybrid model in the future, we just don't know like everybody else, we wait to see what that looks like. So let's talk a little bit about costs because there's an interesting trend here. And so I, for those that are in advocacy, it might be an area to think about. So currently the government of Ontario funds 100% of the cost of child protection mediation in Ontario. So mediation in cases uh, where there's a child protection issue. And they partially fund family mediation through all the court connected services um, and the fees can be as low as zero um, to the family. And so 
considerations look at they look at income number of dependent children and the complexity of the case so it's a, a sliding scale um, currently there is no funding in place for intergenerational mediation but it seems to me that there's a uh, there's a um, um, a precedent already in place for some uh, government funding. So I do think it's an area where um, there's you know, potential, especially as um, if nothing else, COVID has heightened the need to uh, recognize that uh, there's a need to invest in our older population. Uh, and um, so that's sort of just a, a, a screenshot. So, Again, I'm aware of the time, so I'm happy to, to answer any questions or Sheila, did you want to defer them into to the end? No, you know what, I think we will take questions now and, and thank you so much, Maggie. Um, in my work as an elder abuse prevention consultant, uh, I was doing that work in, in southwestern Ontario for a number of years and now taking over the north. Um, I, it, I used elder mediation quite a bit as a referral source. Of course, I had to make sure that folks, you know, folks would have the ability to, to know that there was some, there was gonna be some cost associated, but when it's family dynamics and it seems, you know, that it's escalating because of um, inability to properly communicate, I would really suggest this and um, really happy that, that in the North, I have a, a referral source as well. So uh, thank you, Maggie. I'm gonna see if there's any, well, please feel free to unmute your mic and uh, ask Maggie any questions you have. Um, I think she's been great about giving us some good, uh, good examples of how, how it might be beneficial in terms of the elder abuse scenarios or the potential escalation of, of negative family dynamics. So I turn it over to, to the folks on, on the call today to, to ask some questions. I'm wondering how many folks knew that elder mediation or, or intergeneral mediation was available in the North. Uh, Sheila, it's, it's Madeline. I do have a question. Um, is Maggie gonna be able to share with us when there is more resources uh, in the North? Because I'm a firm believer that elder, um, elder mediation and restorative uh, justice are the way to go for uh, um, abuse uh, within the family. Um, and so um, it's it's not very, I'm hopeful that there will be more and more services. So I can tell you right now, um, we could provide it right now in the North. Uh, I mean, I'm an elder mediator. Um, what I'm saying is I have 30 mediators, you know, located throughout the whole Northern region. And I have suggested that they have encouraged them to get elder mediation training, intergenerational mediation training. The problem is, is that there's no business argument for it because there's no demand. So if the community you know, wanted it, um, then we would match the demand is the answer. I, I have people that are already very experienced mediators um, who could step up. So I've got mediators from Thunder Bay to Timmins, you know, to Manitoulin who, who are there, you know, it's just a, getting them to take another course. So, but you, if you had a referral tomorrow, we could accommodate it. It's, you know, because it's by Zoom. So we would be able to work with the family via Zoom, but it would be my goal that, uh, um, that the mediators in Thunder Bay, for example, would train up so that there would be the option as we move forward in this world for in-person mediations again someday locally. So I guess my, um, I guess the, the issue is probably the cost that prevents uh, the referrals. Now, how did it come about that there was um, the funding for the CAS uh, mediation? Because really, in a way, uh, protection of children and protection of seniors 
is somewhat in the same vein. And so if, if you can get, the government can find money for CAS um, you know, mediation, they should be able to find uh, some for the uh, seniors. And, and obviously you're speaking to the converted on that. So in 2007, the child, child protection legislation was amended, making it a requirement that the societies consider a prescribed method of ADR, of which child protection is one, uh, in every case that they work on. And, and I don't want to suggest that, that that's 100% complied with, but since 2007, we've seen a, a, a steady increase of referrals to child protection mediation. Um, so we, for our agency is currently doing about 300 cases a year. Uh, so in the, in, in, sort of in myself and in, in location, in the North, we're seeing child protection mediation in all, pretty well all communities that, although on a much lower level still, because it's, uh, it's taken longer to, to roll out in the North as most things usually do. So it's, um, um, but it was the change in the legislation that resulted in the, the funding. You couldn't make it a, a mandatory step in the agency level to refer if there was a cost. Um, the family model, because it's also in the family law, um, family laws in, in Ontario and in Canada to have this option for mediation. Uh, and frankly, the service is, is not cost prohibitive. So as I said, if, if the family couldn't afford it, it was zero. If the family could afford it, then there was a fee, but it was, it was on a sliding scale. So, I mean, I, I think both models work, um, but I think that there's an advocacy needed. Um, I know OAFM has been working on trying to advocate on that behalf, but obviously the more voices that uh, speak out um, and, I happen to think that it's in a, we're in a time now, uh, or perhaps post pandemic as we come out of pandemic and, and we actually have normal budget chats again. So right now, obviously the allocation is all so heavily focused on funding the, the services around the pandemic. Um, but the, I think there, there's, a, there's a, the timing is right. People are listening around, um, older adult issues because they've been forefronted as a result of the pandemic. At least I, I'm hoping they still will continue to be forefronted after the pandemic. So I know that OAFM self-funded a, a number of cases within the organization last year, but I did check and their funding is it has completed. Now, whether they renew that, I don't know. Um, but that just was part of their way of developing um, capacity or developing uh, a strategy around intergenerational abuse uh, prevention uh, via mediation. We certainly at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario are trying to create an awareness of the benefits, Madeline. Um, we, we've done quite, we've done several se uh, seminars with um, Ontario Association of Family Mediators and folks who are providing restorative justice initiatives, uh, you know, to educate service providers. And just, I, I find that a lot of folks, when I mention it in community, haven't really thought of that as an avenue for intervention. So that's why I was delighted Maggie could join us today. But hopefully uh, as, we, as we move forward, um, you know, we can also participate in that, in that advocacy effort because it is one of the, one of the intervention services that I've used uh, quite successfully. So thank you. Yeah, I really think, uh, I'm hoping timing is, is right for this to move forward. Other questions or comments? But if anyone has a case that they want to consult on, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and, and I mean, and just so that note, uh, I mean, there are, uh, uh, the service is available in French as well. So it's, uh, um, it is something that, that's available and, and, you know, 
Currently, it's not necessarily going to be local in all locations, but um, that's what they said about family mediation and child protection mediation. And I've been working to change that. So I will make that commitment that if there's demand, we will meet that demand. Thank you so much. And thank you for your willingness to make, to, to help us with that advocacy work. All right. Well, I'm sure everyone wants to get up and kind of move a little bit, maybe need a body break. Um, my clock says right now that it's um, 3.48. So uh, we'd like to pick back up um, if we give 10 minutes, if we could all be back and ready to go. Well, that's my, it's 2.48 in your world. Um, <laughs> so if we could all be ready to, to come back at um, uh, three o'clock and we'll start with the panel that is promising to be um, very informative. So take a break, move your body and we will see you shortly. How cognitive impairment and communication can impact a person living with dementia while increasing their risk for elder abuse. So whether that is a community member, a family member, friend, or person living with cognitive impairment. So very briefly, dementia is an umbrella term that we use to describe a common set of symptoms or changes in a person. A person with dementia can have one or a combination of these symptoms that may include memory loss, changes in their perception, reasoning, attention, concentration, their thinking, impaired judgment, or language. These symptoms must be severe enough to interfere with a person's ability to function. Now, there are many forms or types of dementia as well. Alzheimer's disease is just one. Another form or type could be vascular dementia in the event a person has any cardiovascular issues, um, diagnoses, or if they've had a stroke, or someone might have young onset dementia where they're diagnosed prior to the age of 65. Brittany will now review the A's of dementia and how they might present in someone with cognitive impairment. Yeah, so like Carrie had mentioned, <laughs> Um, we can break these symptoms down into what we refer to as the eight A's. Um, the first being amnesia or memory loss. Then there is um, agnosia, which is loss of recognition. So that could be not recognizing familiar people or objects. Um, anosognosia, which is self-awareness. Um, they are unaware of their own limitations. Then there's apraxia, purposeful movement apathy, which is their initiative, aphasia, which is loss of language, um, for example, difficulty finding words, and there's attention deficits and altered perceptions. So these symptoms can present in ways like someone with dementia saying, someone is trying to hurt me, or there's somebody in my house who's unfamiliar to me, um, this is not my home, um, misidentification of people, the people on TV are real, um, people are stealing from me. So these concerns should be investigated and taken very seriously as they may be very real to the person living with dementia or they may actually be happening, for example, um, financial, physical or emotional abuse. So it's important to confirm prior to just assuming that these are regular symptoms or behaviors of someone with dementia. So once there is no evidence of abuse, we can start to explore and manage um, the contributing factors. So all behavior has meaning. Um, it may be the result of the disease process, they may be in some sort of physical discomfort, pain, or an underlying illness. Um, there might be triggered by a possible change in their routine or staff um, or people coming into their homes who they don't recognize. 
So it's important to try and remember not to take these behaviors personally. Um, look for the person behind the disease and what you know about that person. Um, build on their strengths and focus on their positives. And meet the person where they are in their dementia, where they are in their reality, uh, and accept this reality. So it's important um, to understand that it's our responsibility that we have to change the way we communicate with someone with cognitive impairments um, and our expectations of that person. So we can do this through enhancing communication. As language abilities decrease, a person is likely to become more sensitive to other people's nonverbal behaviors. And it should be noted that nonverbal behavior accounts for about 93% of our communication. This can include tone, pitch, speed, and our body language. And next, I'll just go through some communication strategies that family or friends can use um, for their loved ones with dementia or cognitive impairment. These include re reducing distractions, so making sure that um, TVs are turned down, that there's no visual or auditory distractions. Um, present one idea at a time. Give additional cues or clues if it seems like the person's not understanding. Um, avoid arguing, reasoning, rationalizing, or correcting. Take breaks. Try to remain calm and make good eye contact. Listen to related words and avoid open-ended questions and try to remember to match your verbal and nonverbal communication. As well, there are some communication strategies that can be used for people living with dementia. And these include keeping a pen or paper handy to take notes, share your challenges and coping tips with other people, take a few moments and relax, think about what you want to say or what people want you to do. Um, the words often come from, they come when you're feeling less pressure. And if you cannot remember, just simply say so. And don't be afraid to tell others if you're having a bad day and ask people to slow down. And so I'm going to pass it back over to Carrie and she's going to go through some of the available programs and services that the Alzheimer's Society of Thunder Bay and region has to offer to care partners and people living with dementia. All right, so we do have quite a variety of programs and services that we offer um, here locally in Thunder Bay, uh, as well as in the region. Um, so Brittany and I are both part of the Alzheimer's Society First Link team. So we work directly with individuals and families, um, you know, educating them about what is dementia, strategies on you know how to cope maybe with some of the challenges they're facing and providing that supportive counseling as well. Uh, we do offer support groups for um, our clients um, and as well as a education series as well. So as Brittany noted, um, it's, it's a really big change. Um, the responsibility lies on our shoulders whether that's, again, a community member, family member, friend, uh, staff member in long-term care, to change our approach on how we communicate um, with people living with dementia. When we don't do that, that is where we see the risk of potential elder abuse. Um, you know, whether it's an, a misunderstanding between the person with cognitive impairment uh, and the person they're working with, um, we see this a lot um, when it's time to provide care. So if a person does have cognitive impairment, 
um, and, and some physical impairment and say they need assistance with some personal care and they're not understanding, you know, why or, you know, who this person is that's trying to provide the care, um, you know, we could see risk of, you know, a physical physical abuse or physical assault, you know, we see and hear from care partners, um, you know, I was trying to provide bathing assistance and, you know, the person with cognitive impairment grabbed me and now I have this huge bruise of, you know, a hand mark on my arm. Or if things get really escalated, um, you know, again, that might lead to some physical abuse. So, when we're talking to individuals and families, we're working and coaching on strategies on how to um, reduce or um, redirect some of those behaviors or reactions that are often misunderstood. We also have a, a public education team. So um, similar to today, you know, they can provide education on dementia to members of the public to organizations, um, you know, your workforce, as well as other health service providers. So you can, you know, request some education from us at no cost, and we would be happy to um, provide that. We also run a program called Minds in Motion. So that's an exercise and social program for both people living with dementia and their family members or care partners, as well as a seasonal art program and music project um, that anyone can sign up uh, for online. Essentially, the music project is a iPod lending program through the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. And they load the iPod um, with customized music or um, you know, the person with cognitive impairments, favorite music, and, um, you know, they can utilize that at no cost. And lastly, we are providing activation and caregiver kits. So we are providing these to help with engagement strategies uh, and isolation, specifically um, during COVID. So it's really important, um, you know, to keep people engaged and, and active, you know, both within their homes and in their communities. So in order to uh, access our programs and services, you just have to do a referral. So referring people living with dementia and their families to the Alzheimer's Society's First Link program is considered best practice in dementia care. Anyone can make a referral with a person's consent so whether that's a health service provider, uh, a family member or friend, another community organization, um, as well as self-referrals. So it's, it's very easy to refer yourself. Um, you can simply give us a, a call um, or there is a referral form accessible on our website. And on my last slide here, um, I do have our contact information. Um, so again, you can give us a call, um, check our website out. We do have a lot of really great resources on there, educational material, um, and uh, again, a review of what programs and services we have to offer. So thank you again for everyone involved in hosting this fantastic event um, and all the participants who have attended today. Thank you, Carrie and Brittany. Great information. Um, I remember when my mom was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia, I ended up walking into the Alzheimer's Society and saying, okay, what, a, what am I doing? And I can't tell you uh, how, how meaningful that, that experience with the Alzheimer's Society was for me and my well-being. Those of us who don't believe that caregivers burn out are sorely wrong. And burnout can look a lot diff different for everyone. Abuse can happen that a person who would never raise a voice or neglect or can't, you know, caregiver burnout can bring out things that people would never consider doing otherwise. So we thank you for all the respite uh, services and education you provide because it is very meaningful. We're going to save questions to the end of the panel if that's okay. 
Um, and then we'll take questions on interventions in general, and just have that discussion. So um, our next presenter is Lise Landry. Uh, she's community safety personnel and civilian senior liaison with Greater Sudbury Police Service. Lise has been with the service almost 18 years, starting as a 911 call taker and working in various departments, including records and courts. With her required knowledge, she now helps seniors and their family navigate various issues older adults encounter and source whatever services might be best supporting them. So I'm gonna pull up her slide deck for her. So just give me one moment. Uh, I just have to find it, there she is. Thank you, Sheila. My pleasure. <coughs> I'll just start it from the beginning slideshow. Perfect. And just tell me when you want me to change. Just a minute, it's not going from the beginning, please. Hmm. Can everybody see it first? I can okay. see. Okay, can perfect. Yep. So let's move on to the first slide, the next slide anyways. So I've been asked to talk about my position and what it is I do with the Greater Sudbury Police Service. I'm part of the Community Engagement Unit of the Greater Sudbury Police Service and I'm called a CSP. Um, I replace an officer whose skills and knowledge are better used out on the street. So basically I've re replaced a, an officer who wasn't using skills like investigative skills and wasn't using skills like arresting people and charging people and doing actual police work. Um, so they decided to replace that position with it, a civilian instead who works with the police officers to get those things done but without taking up so much time especially when someone's just calling for information right so csp means community safety personnel there are a number of us throughout the police service and we are in various roles i'm uh the seniors liaison but there's a traffic liaison there's um, um the missing person liaison um so you know there's different roles throughout the service if we can change the slide please all right, we're trying. Just give me one sec. There. So in my unit alone, there are three CSPs. Two of them work with the youth. They go into the schools. Uh, they do uh, VITRO, which is violent threat risk assessments. They work um, with youth referrals from police officers uh, to get children into programming that can help them um, learn skills that they may not otherwise. And I, myself, um, our, my, my unit also consists of two, uh, three school resource liaison, I can't talk today, three school liaison officers and we all report to a sergeant um, and he you know, guides us and assists us as we need. And we also have a staff sergeant who's actually on the line today. Uh, staff sergeant tip lady is our, um, the next person uh, that we would report to. Um, as you can see, I do wear a uniform. Um, today I'm at home, so I don't have to wear my ballistics vest, but if I was out in the community, I would be wearing a ballistic vest and I'd have a police radio on as well so that uh, the service knows where I am and can communicate with me for my safety. We can move to the next, please. So my role is to receive referrals. Um, I receive them from officers out on the road. They can call me and say, you know, Lise, I'm going to a call. Um, how am I going to address the situation? You, you know, there's notes on the file that say that you address, you know, you've assisted this person in the past. What's in place? What do I need to do? And I'll give them some information as to what they might suggest to help the senior. Um, Oftentimes, I will also receive an email um, with a follow-up. Um, sometimes they will get dispatched to a call. They get to the call, realize that there's a senior in need. They feel that that senior is vulnerable. That older adult might need services. Um, you know, they're having mobility issues. They're having cognition issues. Um, they'll send me an email and say, hey, Lise, you know, or task me to say, hey, Lise, can you please reach out to these, this person and and see what, what you could maybe offer them. Um, oftentimes I will send officers out to check on the well-being of an older adult if I'm concerned uh, based on a phone call that I receive. If I receive a call and there's some legitimate concerns to the well-being of a person, 
I will send an officer to go and, and check on them and I will get an outcome and we go from there, of course, right? Um, if we can change the screen, please. I have attended older adults homes in on occasions with an officer when required. Um, we have a rapid mobilization table here in Sudbury where um, sometimes if something is imminently in danger, someone's in imminent danger and needs assistance, I will be asked to attend if it's a senior so that we can make sure that the services the person needs get activated right away. Of course, always um, based on their willingness to accept services. Um, I'm also available by phone call for family members who have concerns or questions and don't know where to turn to because out in the community, when someone needs help, who do they turn to? They call the police. Well, having an officer answer simple questions is really high cost, whereas I'm available now to, to answer those questions and, and direct people to the right services. Um, you know, and sometimes I have older adults who just want someone to talk to. Um, and, and I'm there, you know, they, they may, I, I've had numerous regular callers who just wanted to talk um, and, and I'll take that phone call and based on my time, you know, spend five, 10 minutes with them and it makes their day. Um, it, it gives them someone to talk to, it gives them someone to just know that they're, they're being heard and that's so important to older adults. Next screen. During non-pandemic times, um, I do attend retirement homes, senior buildings, and other clubs, like seniors clubs and stuff, to speak about various subjects. Um, currently, of course, because of the pandemic, I'm only available online, but I can speak in regards to fraud prevention. You know, I do carry the message for the Elder Abuse and Prevention Ontario about elder abuse, and I certainly like to speak about general personal safety, because that's really important as well. And today, it's my pleasure to start a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lise. That's that's a role that I think is um, should be in every community everywhere. Uh, you know, really, when you think about that um, that role, being heard is is really important. We spent a lot of time talking about that through the various presentations and how abuse can happen. Well, how it's abusive not, not to listen to someone who's trying to be heard, That's, that can be neglect. Um, so, so really when we think about the role that Lise is playing, uh, it, it's, it, it's a start to enter a very complicated, very scary, it's very scary system for a lot of folks. So um, I was, when, when, I, when I talked to Lise, I was really excited that she would come and talk about it. I know that it's not everywhere, I do want to give a shout out to someone who's on the line. And if you want to unmute yourself, that would be great, Kevin. Kevin Middleton is, is the officer in Thunder Bay area that does uh, works with the seniors. Um, Kevin, you want to say a few words? If I know you're, you're very sketchy in terms of, of your Wi-Fi, but I just want people to know you're a resource in the Thunder Bay area. Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I've learned lots already today and uh, it's a lot of good ideas, especially just recently with the Sudbury Police, I really like that idea. I'd like to uh, touch base with them, maybe uh, <laughs> get some more ideas and even maybe with the OPP in our region, we can maybe uh, get involved with that idea, the civilian side of it. And, and uh, I am online on the Facebook and uh, my emails. I can add my email if anybody wants to touch base with me offline and if they have any more questions. Have me Terrific, if you don't mind typing that in the, in the uh, chat box, Kevin, that would be awesome. Also, um, Kevin, um, I can give you my email address too. It's very simple. It's lees.landry at gsps.ca. Shoot me an email anytime. Um, also, something, and, and Staff Sergeant Tip Lady kind of mentioned it so that I could mention it as well. Something else that I am, I am trained in crime prevention through env environmental design, and I do do some subset evaluations at times just to help people to determine, you know, safety aspects of their home that they may not be seeing that they need to add to or, you know, things that could be adjusted to make their home a safer place. So, yeah, well needed, well needed. Yes, thank you. You're welcome.
Yeah, it's a, it's a great role that uh, I wish there were more of. So thanks for telling us about it, Lise. Uh, more, more need for advocacy, I think. That might be a takeaway message from today. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, last but definitely not least, I'd like to introduce our final presenter for this afternoon, Madeline Hebel, who called to the bar in 1987 and has been a bilingual lawyer in the legal clinic system since 1991. For the last 14 years, she has worked at the Sudbury Community Legal Clinic and was instrumental in establishing the Advocacy North program for elders and seniors. In 2018, that, that was established in 2018. In the past, Madeline has participated in consultations with the LIN and what was formerly known as the CCAC and appeared before the Ontario Courts of Justice on substituted, on substituted decision-making matters. She is regularly a guest speaker at seminars on capacity issues and power of attorneys and past sessional professor in the law and justice program at Laurentian University. So we're very delighted to have Madeline share her expertise with us today. So Madeline, I'll let you call up your, your slides if you're able. I should, hopefully. If not, I got them as backup. Oh, up there they okay. are. Okay, they are perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Sheila, for having me today. And welcome to everybody in uh, the North. It is uh, a wonderful, uh, forum that we have this afternoon because um, distance kind of keeps us apart and it's harder for us to, you know, network. And this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to do so. Um, today, I want to talk to you about, you know, the legal options for older adults experiencing abuse. However, before I start, I want to talk a little bit about my program. Um, this program was uh, started in the North, as uh, Sheila said, in 2018, because the previous government gave expansion monies to Legal Aid Ontario, uh, and specifically to the legal clinics, to um, service areas of law that were poorly serviced. And so anyone who's a little bit connected to uh, uh, the legal system knows that legal aid has a certificate side with uh, family law and criminal law. And then there's the community legal clinics. And um, we're over 70 of us in the north, uh, not in the north, in the province, sorry. Um, and then we have specialty uh, legal clinics on different either language or, uh, you know, uh, subject matters. ACE Advocacy um, Center for the Elderly is our, one of our specialty clinic and I work closely with them. Uh, but because they're a small office of 11 people, I think, and they have to service the whole province, you can imagine that um, you know, the resources are not there. So anyhow, in the North, they did a uh, study as to which area was under service and elders and senior law uh, was um, uh, pinpointed, and as a result, uh, this program was funded. So I am um, stretched all across northern Ontario. Uh, my territory is, starts in Muskoka, goes all the way to Musuni, uh, to the border of Quebec, um, and to the border of Manitoba. Um, and where I'm only one person in the program. So I've been fighting for a long time to say that we need someone in the Northwest um, just because seniors have, you know, uh, a great deal of uh, need for individual services and, you know, they're unconnected to the virtual world, which makes it, you know, a big barrier. Uh, prior to 2019, I would actually travel uh, several, um, you know, times a year to Thunder Bay and spend a week there, you know, spend, uh, you know, four, four or five days in the Sioux and, you know, places where going there and back, uh, because I am um, hosted by the uh, Sudbury Community Legal Clinic. So I'm physically in Sudbury, but I service all of uh, the North and I welcome contact for uh, agencies and individuals in the areas of law that uh, the program is um, aimed to, um, or was identified as 
being uh, in need. So I do a lot of consent and capacity. I do issues with long-term care homes, uh, home care, um, and of course, physical, emotional, and financial abuse. And I also do uh, some consumer law when a senior was taken in by you know, a door-to-door -door salesman or, or something of that nature. Um, I provide uh, legal advice and representation, uh, but a major aspect of my mandate is to provide public legal education on legal issues that impact seniors. So, and I support uh, community and development and community organizing on, again, legal issues that may affect seniors. So um, any organization who needs someone to speak to uh, their staff or whatever on, you know, power of attorneys or, you know, consent and capacity board or any other um, areas, uh, please contact me and I would uh, gladly uh, do a presentation for you. Um, and so today um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the issues that, you know, are, uh, they're problematic uh, in regards to, uh, ooh, this is not moving, hold on, why is it not moving? Hmm. Right oh, sorry. Okay, I got it. I didn't. Uh, um, um, and um, you know, there is no answer or one size uh, fit all. Um, and you know, some of my comments today, uh, you know, may not be a complete answer uh, because there's so many factors that have to be considered. One of them is what is elder abuse in a legal sense, okay? And so we were drawn something in, sometimes in the conversation as to whether harassment is elder abuse and to which level and, you know, whether bullying, you know, is elder abuse and so forth. So this is a definition that, you know, uh, I think it's from the United, United Nations, um, you know, convention. Uh, but it's kind of a, a, a general uh, idea of what uh, could be elder abuse. Now, under the criminal code, it is a whole different, you know, um, situation. They have, uh, you know, very much different factors that it, they have to meet in order to be able to prove uh, someone guilty. Uh, but in the social context um, or the civil context, um, you know, it's a little bit of a larger uh, definition. Um, now, um, elder abuse can be financial, phys physical, psychological, sexual. It could be intentional. It can be unintentional uh, neglect, uh, especially sometimes caregivers, you know, become totally uh, overwhelmed by the needs and uh, it's not easy to um, get into a long-term care home. You have to actually, you know, the, the hospital is the parking zone for long-term care homes uh, on, in many situations. Um, but there is a lot of risk factors and there are actually legal barriers. And this is where it becomes frustrating a little bit in the area of law of uh, seniors because Often, as been mentioned uh, earlier, there's shared living, um, you know, circumstances, and seniors um, or older persons um, do not like change, and they do not like confrontation. And so, when you have a situation of, an, uh, you know, of abuse within a, a shared living circumstances, and the abuser, abusers are within the um, you know, home, uh, what we've done when with respect to family violence, because there has been a lot of, um, you know, services, uh, you know, we usually yank the victim and send them to a shelter. Um, and then out of the shelter, you know, we work and, you know, we settle them out of uh, the violence. However, uh, for seniors, it's not easy. They don't want to live the area which, because they've performed so much well, better when they are in their regular circumstances. Um, that's, and so bringing them to a foreign, um, you know, setting 
uh, usually will aggravate a lot of, you know, symptoms of dementia. So, uh, so it's, it, it's a big issue um, that uh, you may not have when it's another segment of uh, the population. You also have social isolation. Um, seniors do not reach out to the legal uh, system. And the legal system usually doesn't come to people. You have to go to the legal system. Um, and so it, it's, it's a major uh, barrier. And that's why I, I really encourage working with agencies, especially the agencies that go in people's home, because I know that they're not, the senior themselves are not going to call me. Um, I'm going to get a referral from either a family member or someone else. Um, and of course, there's, you know, issues that have been discussed uh, before about mental economic substance problems. Um, you know, the individual uh, older adult may not even be able to, you know, contact the police. And sometimes the sign of abuse uh, may be um, seen or mistaken for usual aging, right? So, so when a senior is being abused and he's, they, you know, they're under a lot of pressure, you know, they may fall more often and things like that. And often it's, you know, not seen perhaps that, you know, the root of the cause could be, you know, um, the bullying or the stress that um, goes on in the background. So, so you know, in this, uh, you know, uh, all these multiple factors, you know, comes in uh, the legal system. And, um, you know, we're, we're having a, you know, the, the legal system has been able to deal very well with um, children's protection issues uh, to the CAS. And like I said, for the, um, you know, family members that are in, you know, um, that are not seniors, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, um, help that can be done for them to remove them uh, because they usually have choices. Like if, I, if I'm 40 years old and I have um, a, um, I, I'm a victim of, you know, abuse, uh, you know, going, starting over somewhere else is traumatic, but it's not necessarily, you know, um, a brick wall um, as when you're uh, a senior, um, it is somewhat of a, uh, you know, brick wall for the reasons that I've uh, mentioned beforehand. So, um, uh, and sometimes, you know, you're at the end of the life of, of your life and, and who wants to really, you know, pass away when, you know, you're no longer talking to your children or, you know, because you charge them under, you know, criminal code and, you know, they have to go to prison. I mean, most awful circumstances when you want peace and quiet, you know, uh, in your uh, end of life. Uh, the statistics are that um, two thirds of the victims, I believe, of elder abuse are from um, family members, either a spouse or um, a child. So, so that's a major chunk. When the abuse is coming from a neighbor or, you know, someone in another country or whatever, you can stop that. There are better tools to stop it, but not when it comes to, uh, you know, close-knit um, issues. So what are those legal remedies? Um, so um, I have a series of them here that I can talk to. I, I may spend a little bit more time on certain ones than the others. Um, the big one that we kind of, you know, try to focus on is, is it you know, part of a power of attorney document and can it be revoked or can we get the attorney to resign? And, um, but we have to be careful because um, revoking or resigning um, may um, lead to a problem because in order to be able to revoke uh, the power of attorney, you have to have the mental capacity. Um, and the mental capacity is the same whether you are revoking or doing one. And under the Substitute Decision Act, which is the act uh, relating to, um, you know, capacity and uh, power of attorneys, there's four different tests. So there's two tests about, you know, capacity to manage your financial affairs and capacity to 
do a power of attorney. So they're different. You can be capable for one and not capable for the other. And then there's another two tests, which is a capacity to uh, do a power of attorney for personal care and the capacity to care for yourself um, for your personal care, are you aware of safety issues and so forth? So, um, and the tests are, are different, like the threshold to be capable of doing a power of attorney for property is much, much higher than the one to do a personal care one. So I often meet seniors that um, are capable of doing, still have a capacity to do the personal care one, but no longer have the capacity to uh, do a um, property one. So that leaves, you know, um, trying to, you know, cancel in some way the power of attorney for property, either by resignation or, um, or uh, uh, guardianship investigation by the OPGT, which takes a while. They are the first ones to say they're not an emergency service. Um, and so, and then um, if they're found um, incapable of um, managing their finances by a capacity assessor, then it's going to go to the pub public guardian and trustee's office. So, so there's a lot of factors to take into account when you kind of look at which remedy would be the best or, you know, even possible. Um, there's reporting elder abuse to the police, but I'm sure Lise will back me out on this fact that, you know, it's not happening very much because it's understandable that uh, uh, seniors do not want to charge um, a, um, a child. And so um, it's, you know, it's there, but it's really not there in, in practice. Maybe if there were more restorative justices, um, options and where you can you know put them on a different track than you know danger of jail uh then perhaps seniors would be more willing to um you know charge um the child and, and the big thing would be to remove the child because when it's a victim of family violence one of the first things that usually happens is they're arrested brought to jail and then they go to a bail hearing and we put a condition that they have to live somewhere else, right? And so, um, um, so uh, the other one, like I said, is guardianship investigation with the PGT. Then there's the statutory guardianship that usually results from what I said, where there's a capacity assessment. Um, there is a, a not too well known option that sometimes you can go to the consent and capacity board to get a representative uh, appointed and you have civil actions for the recovery of property or you know my favorite one is elder mediation and restorative justice options if if they're out there um, the problem with civil action for the recovery of property is that usually if someone has abused someone um, to um, you know uh, steal money from them chances are they have no money, uh, you know, and you can't get blood out of the zone. So even if you try to, to sue them, you know, it, their income's not there, their assets are not there, and you're never going to see a real judgment out of um, those cir circumstances. And there is a big conflict of interest situation that I always keep in mind, because one of the things that I, I have to mention is that in my program, we always want to speak to the aging adult. Um, I get a lot of uh, referral from family members, and I always have to explain that I, I can't give you legal advice. I can give you some public legal uh, information, but I have to keep myself from not being conflicted out from speaking to the seniors. So put me in touch with the seniors because it's important that we know what they feel about this. You may have uh, a certain vision um, they may have a whole different one, a glass is half full or half empty, depending on the way you look at it. So, um, so we need to know, you know, from the seniors what they want uh, to do. But there's often a, a fight uh, because nowadays, uh, like it was mentioned early, earlier, there's a lot of sh shared living circumstances. And it, there's a financial conflict between the two people because, um, and even 
from the outsider because it's possible that you know um, child A lives with parent and they share their expenses and they share uh, you know the rental costs and so forth and that money is needed from both of them to um, be able to sustain uh, the tenancy or, or the living arrangements. And then it could be a possibility that child B, who's outside, wants the mother to come and live for, with them for the same reason. So, uh, you know, the, the difficulty is, you know, um, our um, system in place for the income for seniors, for the, the poor, low-income seniors is about 1,600 a month. And so, which is way more than someone on ODSP who gets 1100 or someone on Ontario Works that uh, gets basically 750. So for the person on ODSP or on Ontario Works, you know, $1,600 is, you know, uh, could make their life easier. So that's where the sharing arrangements come in. And it's really um, problematic um, if you look at the social context uh, behind all of that. Um, so uh, I'm just going to do quickly because I know that the uh, time is uh, when I start talking, it flies away from me. Uh, so uh, like I said, the uh, test for uh, revoking a power of attorney is different for pr property and personal care. And so um, the one, uh, and, and usually it is the lawyer who prepares the power of attorney who assesses the capacity. We have a whole series of um, uh, questions that we ask to, you know, figure out whether they do meet the test under the legislation. But you'll see that, you know, knowing about your financial situation, and you don't need to know exactly your financial situation, but you have to have, um, you know, an idea if, if you still have to know what you can buy with a $50 or that um, the, you know, 2005 uh, van that you have in the driveway is probably not worth a hundred thousand dollars, right? So, um, and for the personal care, as I mentioned, it's much uh, lower tests and you just have to understand that the attorney has a genuine concern for your welfare and, and you have to appreciate that they may have to make a decision for yourself so you'll just you know if you compare them you 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 can understand why i'm saying one is much higher than the um, other um guardianship investigation i've said that uh it's not an emergency option and there's two things that they don't uh get involved first you've got to be mentally incapable if you're mentally capable they're never going to touch it because people are entitled to do bad decisions um and they have to be satisfied that there is uh, suffering or risk of serious adverse effect. Um, and I've given examples of what it is. Um, so uh, you, um, you have to keep that in mind uh, because um, they may not be able to, in the end, you know, help you because of this. But it's always my, one of my favorites to refer to because as if it's not an emergency, um, because they, um, you know, um, it's an outside agency. Um, and so um, I find that more helpful than, um, it's not as threatening, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Statutory uh, guardianship. I should say that the um, public guardian and trustee's office will not get involved if there is a power of attorney. Um, and unless, of course, the abuse you're alleging is from the uh, attorney. Uh, so um, there is that little quirk where um, they have no power if there's a power of attorney. Um, and so uh, the other aspect that uh, comes into play is that if, for instance, you've managed to, you know, uh, if it was a power of attorney um, issue, you know, get rid of the power of attorney, then you have to go to the uh, capacity um, assessment. Well, the person has a right to refuse to a capacity assessment. And that's the first thing that these capacity assessors uh, do is they will come in and they will explain to the person, you know, um, what they do and what will be the consequences of their role. And, um, and of course, this is only for property. 
Um, and um, if a person says, well, I don't want to answer questions, I don't want to talk to you, go away, they have to, um, unless, you know, it's clear that this person is, you know, incapable just in the way they're talking about, you know, the stuff. But if they still have a capacity to decide, uh, then they, uh, you know, they have to get the consent. Okay. And once it's hap uh, it happens, if they find them incapable, then an assessment, uh, they sign a certificate, it goes to the OPGT, which starts the process. And the first thing they do is send a letter to Post Canada, all the mail comes to us now. <laughs> so, um, and then from the mail, they can see, you know, what the assets are, what's the situation and, and so forth. So um, I'm not so sure how they're doing now, where the stuff is a lot more virtual and by email. Uh, I've never asked them what power they do. Do they have powers to go into the people's emails to you know, figure out um, you know, uh, which bank they're dealing with or if there is bank out there they haven't dealt with. Anyhow, uh, and then once the EPGT takes into power, um, a family member can apply to take over, but then you have to go to um, a process where the PGT won't just turn over their duties to someone without starting to look at, um, you know, what's your management plan and, you know, are you competent to do it? Because we just finished, you know, kicking out someone who was incompetent, right? Um, so um, briefly, I want to talk about the consent and capacity board. Um, and they're, you know, out there um, for, for instance, if you're found incapable, uh, by a capacity assessor, you can object to that capacity assessment and you have six months. And a way to do it is to go to the consent and capacity board. Um, consent and capacity board deals 90% of not 95% of uh, issues under the Mental Health Act, because anybody who goes into a psychiatric unit, there's an assessment done uh, by the psychiatrist if this person is capable or not. And if they're not capable, then they're found. And then a person has the right to uh, have uh, an advocate or a legal aid certificate to, to fight you know, that finding if they say, well, you're gonna be staying in the psychiatric hospital for three months or six months or whatever. So, um, so that's the big meat of their uh, role, but they do on their website have forms and things like that. And this could be a training in itself, but I just wanted to touch upon it. Um, what I did want to touch about is the duty or not to report. And that's one that we need to keep uh, in mind. Um, so the uh, obligation to report, uh, if you see any el elder abuse, um, is um, within the Long-Term Care Act, the Retirement Home Act, and the Substitute Decision Act and the obligations do change. So um, there is three categories of uh, reporting. Um, so there's, uh, this is a little bit of a cheat uh, sheet that I've done, but um, the residents of a long-term care home or retirement home who see abuse are not obligated to do it because there's a power imbalance, right? So if I'm a resident and I know that the other person in my room their son are really mean to them and so forth and slaps them and whatnot, you know, um, they could be putting their own, you know, life in danger by reporting it. So that's why it's not compulsory. What it is compulsory is for staff of long-term care homes and for professional. And they are actually, it's an offense if you don't do it. Um, everyone else, that is, if I walk in into a long-term care home as a visitor or a guest, and I observe, you know, someone slapping uh, a senior, um, I should report it, <laughs> um, but it's not um, uh, an offense if I don't. And then the lawyers and paralegals, uh, because we're, you know, in a confidentiality um, you know, situation, our obligations are a little bit different. Um, however, any lawyer who knows of another lawyer who is financially abusing a uh, client, we are have a compulsory obligation to report them to the law society. Um, so within our colleagues, there is a um, obligation, uh, but not necessarily among a client and 
solicitor client uh, situation. Um, so what is uh, the obligation? And I'm gonna just run through this quickly. Um, it, there's four levels that you have to consider, uh, well, that you have to report if you're a staff in a long-term care home. Um, so improper or incompetent treatment, abuse of a re resident, uh, unlawful conduct, and misuse or misappropriation of a resident's uh, money. Retirement home has exactly the same uh, one. Uh, in this one, just because there was too much wording in the first one, I didn't have room to say that it was the exception uh, of the resident, but this exception under number two is also uh, under the long-term care home. Uh, another resident is not obliged to stool on you know, what they see. Um, now, under the Substitute Decision Act, there is uh, a voluntary reporting uh, to the OPGT of any person who believes to be mentally incapable or experienced. So a social worker or someone else um, who's not an employee of the long-term care home or, you know, um, or is, you know, outside agency uh, would have uh, an obligation to um, report. Um, so, because there is another category that I have here. Um, oh, I should start with where to report, okay. Uh, different places, whether it's a retirement home or whether it's a long-term uh, care home. Um, so, um, and just so that you know, the retirement home regulatory authority is really uh, an agency for licensing uh, retirement homes. Um, so they, they have a, but if you know of an illegal retirement home, like someone has taken six, seven seniors in uh, and are giving them a room in a in a basement and there's no there's only one exit or whatever and there's a danger of fire or whatever then absolutely report them to the retirement homes because they probably don't have a license and uh, the retirement homes reg regulatory authority will step in and either you know force the uh, upgrade or uh, close down the uh, retirement home. It's happening more and more because the the nice retirement homes that we see are so much, you know, out of whack with reality, like who can afford 4000 or $6,000 a month um, in retirement homes. Uh, none of them are um, under the $2,000 a month. So if you're a senior with gar getting the basic guaranteed income supplement, uh, you get about 1600 a month. Well, 1600 a month, you can't meet, there's no subsidies. So you can't go into a retirement home. So the low income senior is really stuck to have sharing living arrangements or, um, you know, on their own, but with home care in the property uh, coming to them in their house uh, because, you know, retirement homes is just out there. It's not... Um, and not accessible to them financially. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, a movement with social housing. Uh, they have, they're having more and more of these senior uh, buildings and they're starting to provide some services um, in these social housing uh, homes. Um, Sudbury has one uh, project going on in one of their Paris Street um, uh, social housing senior home. And I'm, for that because that's what we need um, more and more. So, um, and so um, what about the duty if you're a medical professional or a social worker or whatever, both the long-term care home and the retirement home do provide that you are, um, even if you have confidential or privileged information, um, you uh, have to report it um, unless you you don't have reasonable grounds, but that applies to doctors. Um, I'm not sure who's a drugless practitioner act. I've never really looked it up. I, I'm thinking it's a pharmacist, but I've, you know, the term drugless is, you know, foreign to me in, in, in my world. So I'm not sure, maybe it's home petty people. Maybe that's where, where it means, um, in event, and social workers. Um, so 
Uh, lawyers also have special obligations when you have a, a client under a disability. Um, and so we have an uh, uh, ethical obligation to not abandon a client who has a diminished uh, capacity. And we have to take some steps um, to make sure there's a lawfully or twice representative appointed you know, it could be a litigation guardian or something like that. So this information is online, by the way, it's on in our rules of ethics. I'm not sharing anything that's um, uh, not available out there. Um, so, uh, and we have to disclose the necessary and confidential information um, to take, you know, protective action. So, um, so that's my presentation. Uh, and I know I'm way past the time you gave me, but Sorry, Sheila. <laughs> that is no problem. I'm, I'm really delighted that you went so in depth with a lot of the questions that we get asked. I know that we're just at end. So what I'm gonna suggest um, before we wrap up here, if you could, um, I just put a link in the chat box. Rayanne put it in earlier today. Please complete our evaluation. So, so uh, that's, that's a requirement we have with our funder, as well as for us to continue to offer these kinds of um, sessions for you. It's very important that we get that feedback. I wanted to tell you, Madeline, that Kevin Middleton was very pleased to meet you online because he says he's forwarded many seniors to you. If you haven't had a chance to check the chat, <laughs> the chat. So we know that your services are well received. I'm going to um, ask you to stop sharing if you wouldn't mind. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, and I just want to do a little bit of a wrap up and then everyone is totally free to go. Does anyone have any questions for uh, the panelists? So starting with Carrie and Brittany, and then we had Lise and uh, a wonderful wrap up with You can unmute yourself and, and share uh, any questions, if you have any. Or of course, type them in the box. I hear the little click of people having to leave. I know time is very, and very important. Uh, I, I had a question for Madeline about the reporting of elder abuse. Yes. So um, say somebody discloses elder abuse, like, um, say uh, two spouses are living together and the one spouse is saying, oh, my husband is hurting me or harming me, but they don't want to take any legal action. They're just looking for support. Is it my responsibility as a social worker to report that disclosed abuse? Um, to the uh, PGT, uh, yeah, there's, there's something I could send you the uh, section of the act so you can understand, but uh, yes, there is uh, an obligation um, you know, lawyers are the only ones that um, were not uh, obliged, but you have to have reasonable grounds, right? So, so if you, uh, because a person could set their abuse, but um, they're just seeking attention or, you know, uh, as explained before, they, they, it may not be their reality. Um, and so, but if you see the bruises and, and, and you know, they're very descriptive in what happened, uh, then that's where you would have your reasonable grounds. Okay. So, and the numbers you gave those were like for ones uh, for retirement home abuse, but any abuse of elderly outside of a retirement home, I would contact the PGT for that. Uh, well, for the long term care home, there was the phone number too on that um, page that I had. There was both the retirement home, but also the long term care home on it. Okay, but if somebody's living outside of a retirement home or a lot, like say with a child and their child is abusing them now or something? Um, unfortunately, there's no CAS okay. for, for, for adults, right? So, okay. so you know, it's, it's the PGT or if you really have uh, concerns, then Lise can maybe answer that, but I think you have to go to the yeah. police. Okay. If I please, um, there's a zero tolerance for domestic violence. Um, it's very important that it get reported because especially with older adults, um, if there's dementia involved or anything like that, it could escalate terribly and it could become horribly, horribly, a horrible situation. So it is very important, um, especially like I said, if there's dementia, because they don't recognize their spouse and they could, it could become extreme. It's very important to report it. 
Okay. The other the other resource that folks have that I really want to call their attention to is the senior safety line. Now that's not specific for you're not reporting, but you are accessing resources to navigate a situation. So um, you can call this 24/7, 365 days of the year. I've called it as a service provider just to get some ideas. Um, but it is for seniors themselves in these situations, family members. Anyone can call and be navigated to resources in their own communities. And it's in 200 languages. So it's a wonderful resource to share with older adults and for us as well. Thank you. Um, before we wrap, I just do want to, I know there may be another couple of questions and as long as the presenters can stay, I'm glad for that. I do want to encourage you to come and visit our website. Uh, we have wonderful resources about many of the things you can see here, many of the things we talked about today. So if you come and visit the website, you'll get far more information and some tools um, that might be of assistance for you. And of course, we have just rebranded. So um, if you've been on our website before and it looks different when you hit it, you are, you are there. It just is nice, new and glossy and much easier to navigate than it used to be. So again, there's a link in, your ch in the chat around the survey. If you have to leave, I encourage you to please, um, please do fill that survey out for us. Now I'm just gonna go back to asking for additional questions if there are any. Open up your mics and feel free. I will check the chat box to see if there's anything in there. I think there might be. Just give me a I second. I can't find uh, the link for the, um, I can't find the link for the survey. Oh. It's a little bit higher. Uh, if you scroll up the chat, uh, it was put in at- I just put it back in at the bottom. Oh, okay. And it is up there higher too. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And yeah, I couldn't scroll up any higher than I was scrolling. So I, I was not able to access it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, there aren't any other questions necessarily in the chat, I don't think. Let me just take one more look. But please, please feel free to, uh, this is a great opportunity to ask uh, the presenters questions you might have. Um, no questions in the chat. Are there any other questions from folks who are still on the line? If not, we will close this day. And I once again want to thank each and every presenter that gave of their time and their expertise today. Uh, it was a wonderful learning experience. I think that um, you're taking away, you know, it needs to sit now. For me, it needs to sit and saturate my brain. But uh, it's, it's wonderful to know that these resources and programs and services are existing in, in the North. And um, I'm hoping that you've learned something new today and you'll tell us about it on the survey. All right, last call for questions or comments, that's fine too. All right, without further ado, I'm going to uh, let you all get a movement break again. And um, thank you for participating today. Thanks to the attendees as well as the presenters. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Sheila. You did yeah, a great thank job. You. Yes. Thank, thank you, Sheila. You thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, Sheila. My pleasure.